to 2 Samuel 23 this evening. 2 Samuel 23, we're going to pick up in verse 8. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, last week we had the missionaries, the Martins, with us all day, and so we weren't in 2 Samuel. But two weeks ago, we looked at the first seven verses of 2 Samuel 23, and it starts out with, now these be the last words of David. I told you, these are not like the last words that he uttered before he breathed his last and, and closed his eyes in death. Rather, this, these seven verses here are the last literary words of David to the children of Israel. And this evening, we're going to come to yet another part of the epilogue. You remember, we, we've been going through a portion of, of Scripture starting in chapter 21 and going here through, uh, through the end of the, the book that is kind of an epilogue to the life of David. The events are not recorded chronologically, especially the events that we're about to see here this evening. This evening we come to, I could call it the epilogue, which is the, the list of the characters. I was reading a book here recently, and it was primarily about Russia. And so it had all of the Russian names. If you've ever read a book with Russian characters, you know that most Russian people have two or three or sometimes four or five names by which they go. And so this book had in the, in the front few pages, it had an a index of characters. And I used that a lot as I was reading through that book because I couldn't keep the name straight until I got about halfway through and then finally it started to click. And so here we have kind of the index of characters of David's mighty men, the role of David's mighty men. If you remember, David came into the public eye in 1 Samuel 17 when he killed a giant in the valley of Elah. His name was Goliath. And, and then, right after that, David was brought into the employ of, of King Saul and on, on a more steady basis. He had been with Saul a little bit before that. But he was, his, his life was kind of marked by over-the-top acts against the enemies of Israel. You remember that Saul told David... If you want my daughter's hand in marriage, then you need to bring me proof of death of, of 100 Philistines. And David brought 200. <laughs> right? he, he was constantly doing things in a big way when it came to battle, when it came to warfare. When David fell out of favor with King Saul shortly thereafter, he was forced to flee from him. In 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, we read, David therefore departed thence, meaning he left Gibeah. That's where, the, that's where Saul's palace was. He departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went thither, down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So this collection of misfit toys, if you, if you want to call it that, all of, the, all of the malcontents of Israel start filtering their way down to David. It would grow to as many as 600 in 1 Samuel 23, 13. And these men would form the core of David's army, which would follow him loyally until he would become king. And then they would form the core of his army when he became king and, and on into his reign. There's a similar list to what we're going to look at here this evening in 2 Samuel 23 that is found in 1 Chronicles 11, verses 10 to 41. And it includes some names that are not listed here in this chapter. We believe that this is probably because there's a core of about 30. Give or take, there's 32, there's 37 on this list that we're going to look at tonight, but they're called the 30. And some of them passed away, and so new names were added to replace them. And so that's what you see in 1 Chronicles. The list in 1 Chronicles 11 is given very close to the beginning of David's reign, where what we're going to see here is given towards the end of David's reign, very likely. It should be noted that on neither of these lists of mighty men, of the men who were around David, who were holding up his hands, these men who were mighty in battle, there is one name that is very conspicuously absent, and that is the name of Joab. And as, as we've gone through 2 Samuel, 
I struggle with which column to put Joab in. Was he a hero or a villain? And the truth is, it depends on when you find him. Uh, sometimes he was, he was a scoundrel. But if you read ahead into 2 Samuel 24, you'll find he was actually really on point. He was doing good and he was speaking for God even. So, but he misses this list very likely because he was responsible for the death of Absalom. And uh, not to mention Abner and several others who he killed in cold blood. This list is broken into three parts. There's the first three, then there are two honorable mentions, and then there is the group that is collectively known as the 30. We start off, and we won't deal with all of them because we don't have details about all of them, but I love what we do know about these few men here. We start off with Adino, the Esnite. Look at verse 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. So here's, here's the commander of the mighties. Chief among the captains, the same was Adino, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. So... This is not the notches in Adino's belt after a, a lifetime of battle. This is one battle. I, I put it up here on the screen. I want to show you the magnitude. This is what 800 to 1 looks like. And if you say, did you actually count those out? I did. There are 800 little orange men down here. There's only one of the little blue guys. Okay. That's what 800 to 1 looks like. If you think about it, if they lined up in, in single file and were walking past you and you had to kill 800 men, that's a lot. When they're all fighting against you and it's not one of those 70s martial arts movies where they all get in a line and then they attack you one by one. But when they're all getting on you at once, this is quite the, quite the feat of military prowess. The only other account that comes close to this, it actually exceeds it, was found in Judges 15 when Samson killed 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Again, a very uh, obviously had the hand of God upon him. I wish scripture gave us more detail about this particular battle, but it doesn't. All we know is that because of his prowess, because of his abilities... Adino became the chief of the captains of David's personal army, which I think you could make the case that all of the names that we see here in this chapter, they're all captains. They're this, these 30, they're kind of the officer corps of David's larger army. Let's look at the next one. We know a little bit more about him. Eliezer, the Ahohite, verse 9. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. We don't have a lot of detail, but there are some things that we can kind of infer about this story from what we do have here and also in First Chronicles. There were three mighty men. He says here he was one of the three mighty men with David. So we have a total of four men in this case. Four men who were going against a, an, an unnumbered uh, group of Philistines. The men of Israel, we're told, have gone away. This would be during the reign of Saul. That, that's what we can learn from that. So while David is, he's, he's over Saul's army, he has these four men, including, three men, including him, himself, we have four total, and they're going to go up against the, the Philistines. We're not told the odds either. We were told that with Adino. We're not told here the odds, but Eliezer was willing to fight, and he starts hacking away at the enemies of God. And he hacks and hacks and hacks with his sword until... His hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. So he fought past the point where he was tired, and he fought to the point where he really couldn't release the sword even if he wanted to. I have 
never gotten into a sword fight that lasted that long. Truth be told, I've never gotten into a sword fight at all. So, uh, but uh, I have I have worked with a chainsaw. I've worked with a weed eater, and maybe you've done this where I, I've worked with with a, a weed eater, especially where I'm weed eating a large patch and, and I'm swinging a weed eater back and forth for a long time. And when I'm done weed eating, I'll set the weed eater down and I pull my hand away and it, and it looks like this. You ever, you ever had that happen? Your hand just kind of, you've got the vibrations and all of this stuff and your hand kind of locks up and it takes you a little while to get things back how they're supposed to be. Well, here we have Eliezer. He's in a sword fight, and he's hacking away to the point where his hand cramps up. Some also, they kind of get gross about it. They say, well, it could be that the gore from the fight ran over and made his hand freeze up to the sword. I don't mean to get graphic. Could be, but he couldn't drop his sword. He's to the point where he's, his hand clave unto the sword. But he kept going, even though he was exhausted. He didn't fight till he ran out of energy. He fought until he ran out of enemies. That's really something. We don't even know how many men it was. But when he finally peeled his fingers off the hilt of his sword, there was nothing left for anyone to do. That's what it says here in, in verse 10, that they came back just to, just to spoil the bodies. When, when Eliezer was done, there was nothing more to be accomplished. I'm going to draw some parallels to our lives, and they won't have to do with sword play, but there are many parallels that we can learn from these men. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You ever get tired? I don't mean you ever get sleepy. We all get sleepy. If we stay up long enough, we'll get sleepy. Do you ever get weary? Do you ever get tired to the point where, where you're just, you, you've done about all you can do. I've used the, the term running on fumes. What do you do when you get tired? It's real easy. Perhaps you've noticed in your life, it's very, very easy when you've exerted yourself beyond where you're comfortable, when you've gone beyond the point of exhaustion, it's very easy to make spiritual blunders in that setting. Do you think it is a coincidence that when Satan, the only time that we have recorded that Satan himself went against the Lord Jesus Christ, do you think it's a coincidence that Satan waited until Jesus had been in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? There's no coincidence about it at all. Why? Because when our body is in a weakened state, our mind often follows. That wasn't the case for Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He was able to withstand that, that attempt. But somebody said once that the true test of a man or woman is what it takes to stop them. And when you and I reach that point of exhaustion where we've, we've been going for a long time and, and I'm just tired. It's real easy in those times for us to, to give up. It's real easy in those times for us to kind of seed spiritual ground that we've gained. We can learn a lesson here from a man who, do you suppose Eliezer was tired? I, I think he was beyond tired. But he kept going even though he was tired. Let's look at the next one here on the list. His name is Shama. Now, David has a brother named Shama, but this is a different one. After him, verse 11, was Shama, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. And there was a piece of ground full of lentils. The people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. I was thinking about this. There are some meaningful monuments to us as American citizens. There are, there are landmarks. There are, there are places in America that, that, that they touch us in a patriotic way. We, we like, we, you've got Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore, it's a neat thing. You've got the Statue of Liberty, maybe the, the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument. And when I say that, that we like them, here's what I mean. If 
a enemy force invaded the United States and you saw them desecrating Mount Rushmore, that would kind of that would kind of rub you the wrong way. If you saw a, an invading army come into the United States and they knock down the Washington Monument just for cause, that would grate on you as an American citizen. And Shama here, in this case, he's watched the Philistines. They would make they would make bandit runs where they would come into Israel and they would they would loot a whole area and pillage and then they would go back home. And Shama has watched the Philistines crawl all over his country, and it irked him to the point where he finally had enough. And for Shama, the bridge too far, the point where he said, nope, I'm not, I'm not backing up, his bridge too far was, did you see what it is? It's a piece of ground full of lentils. Now, I like lentils as much as the next guy, but fighting over them? That's what he's doing here. The Philistines are advancing. It says that the people of the people fled from the Philistines. They're at the end of verse 11. The people that the Philistines are advancing, the people are retreating, but Shammah has had enough. He determined that the Philistines, they're only going to claim this patch of lentils over my dead body. And so he commenced to fight. And because of one man who was willing to fight and stand for for what others would consider, it's just, it's just a patch of lentils, man. Let it go. Let's, let's defend some other patch of land. Let's find another hill to die on. Have you ever heard that phrase? Let's find another hill to die on. He said, no, <laughs> no, enough. They, they've had that land and that land. They're not getting this patch of lentils too. I'm going to stand here. If they take it, it'll be because I'm done. And because of one man, Who'd had enough and stood up and fought, the Lord brought a great victory. Again, to draw some parallels for application, there are lots of little insignificant issues in our lives, aren't there? Lots of little insignificant issues that we think, well, you know, again, we hear the phrase all the time, and perhaps we've used it, I hope, in the right context. We say, well, that's just, that's just not the hill to die on. There are little insignificant portions of our life. Maybe it's a habit that it, it started out very, very small, and it, it's, it's grown steadily over the years. But we think, well, yeah, it's just, it's just this habit that I have. Everybody has habits. It seemed insignificant when you started, but now it, it kind of runs the show. It started out as insignificant, and because you seeded that ground, now you've got a major issue. There are other in, insignificant, let me put it in quotes, there are other insignificant issues that all of us have in our lives that Satan would love to, to, to point out their insignificance. Excuse me. That there are other insignificant issues that a lot of people would say, well, you know, I'm not going to stand up on this. It's not worth the struggle. We often allow ourselves to lose spiritual ground by telling ourselves... <coughs> It's just, this is just not that important. There are things that I'll fight for, but this is just not that important. But surprisingly, life is not so much a series of massive earth-shattering decisions as it is a very long series of small, seemingly insignificant choices that we should make with the leading of the Spirit of God. Have you found that to be the case in your life? Of, of, of course, we have some big decisions where we think, man, I need lots of prayer. This, this decision right here is going to change my life because I'm taking a new job. I'm moving across the country, whatever it is. There are some of those decisions, but, but life is not made up of those decisions. Life is made up of a lot of decisions that you make throughout every day that I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to read that. I am going to be here. I'm going to speak to this person. Life is made up of lots of little decisions. And when we start yielding those little decisions, if we start giving over the <laughs> patches of lentils, if we start giving those over, we say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stress about this. I'm not going to make a big deal about this. We're losing. 
because little things matter. I found a poem that says this very, very well. I don't know who wrote it or I'd give them credit. It's called For Want of a Nail. It says, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. And for want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Now that, that might be overstating it a little bit, but not much. Life is made up of little decisions. Are you willing to walk with God and take seriously the little decisions? Sure, we're all willing to say, well, I need God on the big things. But you need God on the little things. You need to stand up and do right when you say, well, it doesn't really matter. No, it does matter. Because lots of little defeats lead to a life that is out of the will of God. Let's look at the next one. We don't know, it's actually not one, it's three, and we don't know their names. We're given an account of bravery of three of David's mighty men, but their names are not attached to, we could call it their certificate of valor here. Look at verse 13. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. So very likely around the same time as what we were reading before. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. That's the valley of the giants. You remember the Rapha means giant. And David was then in an hold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. Why would David care about Bethlehem? Well, that's his hometown. David, David grew up on the hills outside of Bethlehem. Verse 15. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate. Who was David giving this order to? It was not an order. He wasn't giving an order to anybody. He's thinking out loud. David's homesick. His hometown is in enemy control, and he's just talking as he thinks about his boyhood. He says, man, I, I wish I had a drink from this particular well that's in Bethlehem back there behind enemy lines. Well, verse 16 and the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. I was able to be, when we were in Israel, almost exactly a year ago, when we were in Israel, we were in Bethlehem, and it is right now in Palestinian control. It's in one of the areas where Jews are not permitted to go. But I got a picture of the well of Bethlehem. This is the well. Now, it didn't look anything like this when David was talking about it. It would have been a well that you let a bucket down into. But this is the well that's close by uh, the wall of, of Bethlehem, or well, where the wall of Bethlehem would have been in this day. But while David is thinking out loud about this well and, and this drink of water, some of his men overhear it, and they decide, among the three of them, that if David wills it, then we will it too. We're going to do it. And so these three men put on a three-man assault of the enemy force in Bethlehem. And, and I, in thinking about what it is, this is not that they, they just fought a few Philistines then went and filled the water up. They fought all the way to Bethlehem and then they fought in Bethlehem because that's where the garrison was. And then two of them fought while one of them let a bucket down because the Philistines wouldn't give you a water break so they have to let the bucket down then they have to put the, put the water in something while they're fighting. And then they get their, their, their whatever they have, probably a, a, a skin of some sort. They get the, the water in it that David wanted. And then they fight their way back. Can you imagine what the Philistines thought? <laughs> they thought, surely these guys are after our, our, our treasure. No, they weren't after the treasure at all. They're after the water in the well. <laughs> and they got it. And then they fought their way back. 
And they come to David and they say something to the effect of, Here, here's the water you wanted. David says, I, I didn't tell you to go get water. And he hears of the risk that had, had gone into getting him this drink. And, and rather than drinking it, he says, to drink this water that these men risk their lives for, he says, would be the equivalent of drinking their blood. I can't do that. This, this is too precious. And so he poured it out as an offering unto the Lord. That kind of loyalty. He says, Lord, this, this I'm, not, I'm not going to drink. I offer it to you. I wonder what these three unnamed men thought when David poured their water out. I, I would imagine they were spiritually minded enough to know what he was doing. This is extreme loyalty. This is extreme dedication. Because why? Because they, it wasn't that the king said, hey, you three, come here, go get me a drink. That's not it at all. They overheard David daydreaming out loud that he wanted a drink from this well, and they risked life and limb to get it for their king. That's, that's amazing. Boy, I wonder if our king has any desires that we can fulfill for him. What do you think? I could take you to lots of them. Let me give you just one. 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does our king want? He wants everybody to have at least the opportunity to hear the gospel. And these men were willing to go and fight. They were willing to risk life and limb for a drink for their king. But, you know, if we're not willing to do something as simple as pass out a track or speak to our neighbor or family member, then we're kidding ourselves if we think that we do the, the big things for God. Do you think that these men would lay down their lives for David if the, if, if the need arose? I have no doubt that these three men would have stood up and said, no, I'll, I'll die before he does. Why? Well, because they proved it by doing, doing great things for something insignificant. We kid ourselves sometimes. Do you remember Peter? He kidded himself. <clears throat> the night when Jesus was betrayed, do you remember the conversation that Jesus had with Peter? Peter was saying, oh, I'll, never, I'll never deny you. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to prison with you, Jesus. I'll die with you. He said he died with Jesus, but just a few hours later, Peter was the one who, when a little girl walked up to him and said, you were with Jesus, right? He said, no, no, I don't, I don't even know who you're talking about. He, he thought he'd do the big things, and he wouldn't even do the little things. These men, they did the insignificant things, proving their loyalty, their dedication. If these men would risk all to get their king a drink, what should we be willing to do for our Savior, for our king, for the high king, the king of kings? Let's look at two more here this evening. The next one is Abishai, the son of Zariah. Look at verse 18. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief among three. Some believe that that's referring that he was the, the commanding officer of the three who we just read about who went into Bethlehem and got the water. He lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them. You say, Psh, well, that's nothing. I mean, we got a guy who did 800. So, I mean, this guy doesn't really have much to talk about, does he? <laughs> 300 is still a lot. He slew them and had the name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore, he was their captain, howbeit he attained not unto the first three. So we have the, the, the top three, and then we have the next three. They're, they're definitely something, the honorable mentions. Abishai, we know him a little bit. We've, we've seen him throughout the story of David. He's one of David's nephews by his sister. Zariah is the name of a woman, not of a man. Zariah was David's sister, so Abishai is David's nephew, along with Asahel, verse 24, another of the mighty men, and Joab, who I mentioned does not make the list. 
Abishai has had several, he's, he's come up several times through David's life story. He commanded portions of David's army. He was the one who asked to, to pin Saul to the ground when he slept in 1 Samuel 26. Do you remember that when David was standing there and Abishai said, David, I, we can end this right now. Just let me hit him one time. I, he says in that passage, he says, I won't hit him again. Meaning, I can accomplish everything I need to with one, with one jab. Well, David stopped him. He's also the one who, if you remember when David and his family were fleeing Jerusalem under Absalom's revolt, there was a man named Shimei who came out and was cursing and throwing dirt and rocks at David and his family. And Shimei was walking next to David and he said, let me go take off his head. That, that, those were his words. He, he can't cause problems if he's not breathing, David, so let me do it. And David said, no, no, we're not going to do that. Abishai, perhaps a bit bloodthirsty, but a man who was greatly used. That's all we know of Abishai. Let's look at, this is my favorite. And it's not just the name, uh, but he does have a cool name. Verse 20, Abishai, or I'm sorry, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. Benaiah, verse 20, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Tabzeel, who had done many acts. Here are some of his acts. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. Now, I went and tried to figure out, what is a lion-like man? <laughs> well, they don't know exactly. Maybe it's that they fought like lions. Perhaps they had some physical attributes that made them look a little bit like them. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and he went down to him with a staff. He plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. This guy's story is tremendous. And one day I'm going to preach an entire message just on Benaiah because we have a lot more information about him. He's a man who seemed to enjoy doing hard things. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. And he killed a lion in a pit in the wintertime. Now I want you to walk through this with me. Let's just look at this logically. If you had a lion... And, and it was a living, breathing lion. Where's a good place to put a lion where it can't bother people? A pit would be pretty high up on that list, right? If it's deep enough, you'd say, hey, the lion's, where's the lion? It's in the pit. Don't, don't have to worry about the lion because it's down there. It, it does say, however, that he, he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in a time of snow. If you were tasked with killing a lion in a pit, how would you do it? Even with rudimentary weapons, I'd find a bow and arrow. How about you? I'd stand on the outside of the pit, and I'd shoot down into the pit because I'm not getting down in there with the lion. But he doesn't do that. He, he's killing a lion that's in a pit. He goes down into the pit to do it, and he does it. In the wintertime, to which we would all say, well, if we were tasked with it, we'd say, it, it can absolutely wait till spring. I'm, I'm not doing this. It's cold outside. I'll, I'll do it from the top of the pit. But this man, again, he seemed to thrive on, on difficulty. He also killed this massive Egyptian. First Chronicles gives us a little bit more information. He says that uh, the Egyptian was five cubits. That's seven and a half feet tall. That, that's pretty tall. If you're familiar, Shaquille O'Neal, who played center for the Los Angeles Lakers, was seven foot two. He's a pretty big guy. This guy was taller than that. All of these actions were rewarded by David. Benaiah would go on to be the captain of David's personal bodyguard. If you remember, when you read about the Cherethites and the Pelethites, they were, they were commanded by Benaiah. Eventually, Benaiah would go on to be the commander of the entire army. And the life of Benaiah will come into sharp focus towards the end of David's life. And then as Solomon comes into the throne, Benaiah will have a tremendous hand in all of that. Is there a lesson that we can learn from a man who kills lions in pits in the winter? I, I think there are. Let me, 
Let me just give this as application. If you're looking for a convenient time to do right, when will you do right? Not often. Probably not ever. But if you're trying to do what's convenient, you'll never do what's right. Satan will see to it that it will always be easier for you to serve self than to serve God. Benaiah wasn't concerned with the fact that, oh, it's hard. They seem to look for hard things and go do them. And, and when we feel like, well, I can't, I, can't, I can't get up earlier and spend time in my Bible. I, I can't. Well, if I share it, if I hand that person a track, they might laugh at me. What do you think the men who we've read about would say to that attitude? They'd probably laugh. Why? Because they were used to doing these things. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. <laughs> that, that's for all of us, men and ladies. Stand up. Do the hard things. Don't wait till it's convenient to do what's right. The rest of the mighty men we find in verses 24 to 39, as much as you might enjoy hearing me read all of those names, I'm not going to do it. Okay? You go home, you read it yourself. It's mostly just a list of very difficult to pronounce names. I, I have read them many times, but I would butcher them. Uh, you can ask my daughters. We're reading through uh, the Bible just straight from the front, and every now and again we get to one of those chapters where it's a bunch of names and Boy, it's rough. So I'm not going to read them out loud, but I would encourage you to read them. Let me just bring your attention quickly to two men who are mentioned. In verse 34, you, it mentions Eliam. Eliam was one of David's mighty men. He is called the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. Eliam was Bathsheba's father. So just to keep that in your mind, that's, that's a connection. And then in verse 39, the last one, the last one to make the list. Look at it. It says, who is it? Uriah the Hittite. 30 and 7 in all. The man who David murdered to cover his sin with his wife. If you think about it, that David would be willing to murder in cold blood a man of the caliber that we're reading about here. That speaks ill of David, at least at that time. <clears throat> this is a fun passage of scripture to go over. I enjoy looking at these. First Chronicles, again, read, read First Chronicles if you'd like. It's, it's pretty interesting, too. It's a fun passage of scripture to go over, but there are some parallels and lessons that we can draw. From Eliezer, Eliezer kept fighting even when he was tired. Will you? You're going to get tired this week, probably, if not this week, next week. When you get tired, are you willing to keep in the spiritual fight? Or do you start giving up ground? Shama was willing to fight to keep what seemed small and insignificant from falling into the hands of the enemy. Shama's the one who said, nope, we're not, we're not going to give up this patch of, of lentils. And it's not because he loved lentils, it's because he said they've gone far enough. Are there little things that you've allowed to slip in your spiritual life? Is there ground that you've said, well, it's just a little bit, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to make a big deal about this. Make a big deal about everything in your spiritual life. Don't give up ground that was bought at great price. The three unnamed men were willing to hazard their lives for the desires of an earthly king. I don't have an earthly king, but I do have a heavenly father and a heavenly king, and I should be willing to ex expend all, to risk everything to fulfill his desires. And from Benaiah, a man who did hard things in the service of his master, what are you waiting for to choose to do right? You say, well, it's, it's just not convenient right now. It doesn't matter if it's convenient. Do right. You know, it's, I, it's unpopular. It doesn't matter if it's popular. Do right. That's one of the lessons, one of several lessons that we can learn from these men. Any questions, comments, thoughts that you have from the role of the mighty men? Fun passage of Scripture.
I love going over these guys. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this evening. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these instances that are recorded for us in your word of men who did great things. And Lord, while we may never be called on to fight in battle as they were, Lord, we have many parallels to our spiritual lives. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to stand up, that we would be willing to risk all for you, that we would be willing to, to not allow Satan to have one inch of the spiritual ground that we've gained through your power. Lord, that when things get hard, when we get tired, that we would carry on, that we would continue in the fight, and that we would see you do wonderful things. Lord, we love you. We thank you once again for your word, for the, the examples that we have. Lord, I thank you for each and every one who's here this evening. I pray you'd be with those who can't be with us for travel, or for health, or for other reasons. I pray you'd be with those who are sick. I pray that you'd help them to be able to regain their health very quickly and return to us. For those who are traveling, give them traveling mercies. Bring them back to us as well. Lord, I pray that we'd be faithful servants until we meet again. Till you call us home. In Jesus' name.